Hey there and welcome in. My name's Steve and I'm going to be your tour guide today as we take a look at the old railroad route of the Virginia and Truckee Railroad as it ran between Carson City and Reno. The Virginia and Truckee was one of the most famous short line railroads in the world. And while this isn't meant to be a concise history, I thought it'd be fun to look at the old route between Carson City and Reno and, and see the physical reminders that are still there. A lot of the old railroad bed is now under subdivisions and torn up uh, in farmers' fields and changed because of highway alterations, but there's still some, some things that you can see to remind us of those old days. So let's go take a look and all aboard. This vacant lot near the corner of Stewart and Washington Streets in Carson City would have been the start of the journey. This lot was the location of the Virginia and Truckee Railroad shops, which was a huge stone building built in 1873, and it was here where uh, the railroad was maintained. It stood for decades and decades, and despite the pleas of pre preservationists, it was unfortunately torn down in the late 1980s. This is the Carson City Depot of the Virginia and Truckee Railroad, which served as its headquarters. And it stands in its original location right here in the heart of downtown Carson City. And it's about a block from where the V&T shops were. So for many, many years, since the 1870s, this building handled passengers and freight. And I think it's just cool that it's still here in the same location. The Virginia and Truckee Railroad was conceived to start in Virginia City to get uh, raw ore out of the mines and down to the mills on the Carson River and get passengers and freight down to Carson City. In 1871, it was decided to extend the line from Carson City to Reno, and by doing so, the line would meet up with the Central Pacific Railroad, which was the Transcontinental Railroad. And by doing so, Virginia City would have direct rail access to San Francisco. So after picking up passengers and freight at the Carson City Depot, the train would leave and go right up Washington Street here in Carson. And it, the line went right down the middle of the street. And uh, needless to say, they didn't have the safety measures that we do today, so there were uh, more frequent accidents. We've taken a short detour off the line to Division Street here in Carson City to visit the home of Henry Yarrington, who was, in 1872, made the superintendent of the V&T Railroad. And it's just kind of curious how they built this home. This kind of looks like a railroad car. And incidentally, this home is right next door to the home of Orion Clemens, who was the brother of Sam Clemens, Mark Twain. So Mark Twain, I'm sure, walked past this location many a time. All right, this is one of the best preserved parts of the route between Carson City and Reno. This is the Lakeview grade. After leaving Washington Street and uh, meandering through farmland, uh, the train would reach here. And uh, uh, again, this was called the Lakeview grade. It was t a two and a half percent grade, which is kind of a struggle for those old engines. But uh, let's take a hike up in here and you can uh, uh, envision what it was like back in the 1870s. Imagine what it would have been like for these engines to struggle up this grade on their, on their way to Reno. All the steam, the, the noise, it must have been something to witness. Those old steam locomotives of the 19th century, and for that matter trains today, can't just take hills going like this. They have to do it at a slow, slow rate. There's a specific formula, so many feet per thousand yards or something like that. Anyway, uh, it's, it's just really awesome that the, these 19th century engineers uh, planned out this route to meander through the hills so the, the train could make it all the way up to Reno. Keeping snow off the route must have been a full-time job and they had the big tools to do it. Take a look at this fill. They uh, had to build this whole area up in order for the train to pass through this gully region. Easy to do with today's modern power tools, but uh, back in 1872, I can't imagine. 
This was the location of a tunnel, the Lakeview Tunnel, called Tunnel Number One, and it caved in years and years ago, actually during the uh, the time of the VNT. So they built this little shoe fly or detour right around where the tunnel was. I've been meaning to complete this whole railroad bed trail for years, and I finally did it today. It's about two miles in. I, I went part way up several years ago, but now there's some interpretive signs and some benches. It's pretty cool. So once you get to the end of the two miles, the trail just kind of ends because, uh, well, the, the modern highway had to be dug out. All right, this has been great exercise. And I'm telling you, I need the exercise. I've been dealing with this weird low back pain for quite a while now. And uh, walking and hiking is good. Exercise is good. Sitting, bad. There's a little piece of a railroad spike someone found and left. So yes, the train did go through here. There are really cool views of Carson City and the Carson Valley from up here. Before there were cars and trucks and buses, unless you were on a horse, this was the road to Reno. Did I mention they carved this out in 1872? I love this stuff. There is a very visible part of the old roadbed in Washoe Valley. If you're driving between Carson City and Reno, just before where the highway rises into the newer portion where the bridges are, you can look off to the right and see the old roadbed travel off into the distance through old farm and ranch land on its way to our next stop, which is Washoe Canyon. This is a photo of what was left of old Washoe City in 1942. And this is what's left today, not much. The V&T went right in front of these old buildings, and the building behind me is the same one in this old photo, the last one in the row. To me, this is one of the coolest locations on the whole railroad line from Carson City to Reno. This is Washoe Canyon, and this location's right across the street from those old buildings in old Washoe City. You can see the cut behind me and what's left of the old bridge. I was here in about 2007 or 2008 and most of the wood structure of the bridge was still intact. Uh, but then a fire came through about 10 years ago during the dead of winter and uh, unfortunately took away the rest of uh, the wooden structure of the bridge. But the abutments are still here, you can still see those. This is the location of this photograph which was taken near the end of the life of the Virginia and Truckee. Um, a number of rail fans got to one last ride on the old train before it was dismantled. And this is where that was done. Many an old historic photograph were taken right here in this canyon, uh, including the train spiraling over a bridge that was right behind me. You can still see the, the rock work of the, uh, the foundations. If you use your imagination, you can just picture those old steam trains barreling through this canyon, the, the noise bouncing off the walls, the, the, the steam billowing up. It had to have been glorious. Oh yeah, in case I didn't mention it, we have some pretty awesome mountains here in Northern Nevada. That's Mount Rose, and this is uh, what's left of the old 395 highway. After the VNT left Washoe Canyon, it generally followed the route of the old 395 all the way up into Reno. And as far as what this reporter has found, there's not a lot of physical evidence between there and here. But here in Reno is where, again, we pick up the scent. We're here on Holcomb Avenue. And if you study Holcomb pretty closely, you can see that uh, it's a wider than most neighboring streets. And that's because the VNT went right up the center of Holcomb just like it did Washington Street in Carson City. So the train made its way right up the middle of Holcomb, up towards the Reno train yards, and ultimately to the Reno Depot. This is the Truckee River crossing of the V&T. 
And this location is located right behind the National Automobile Museum. And you've probably seen these stone structures if you've ridden your bike or walked along the bike path down here, but it's right on the bike path. And uh, this is where the bridge crossed. And there was some development on the other side of the river some years ago. And as I understand it, a fuss was put up to preserve the uh, uh, bridge support on the other side. The old bridge was just adjacent to the Reno Yards, which had shops and storage facilities and a huge turntable. All of it's long gone now. It's just a big empty lot. All right, so this is the end of the line, the Reno Depot. The VNT train would pull up here on, I guess, the back side of the building. And the main trains, the Transcontinental Railroad, the Central Pacific, the Union Pacific and such would, would be on the other side of the building. And passengers could disembark here, enjoy their stay in Reno, or jump on the other train for points west and east. All right, I hope you've enjoyed your excursion today on the Virginia and Truckee Railroad. You're joining us today from Casa de Ellison because we are filming on Easter Sunday and the beer place that I wanted to go today is closed. <laughs> so joining me today is Mr. Spencer, my kiddo. He's going to be my, my uh, assistant today and demonstrator and such. So um, today we're going to talk about how to enjoy a good craft beer. And unfortunately, you've probably been doing it wrong. Sorry to bring you that news. Pour it in a glass. There's 20, 20 odd specialized beer glasses for different different types of beer, but if you want to explore that, great. But even if you use a red, humble red solo cup, you're, you're uh, in way better shape. Uh, bottles and cans are meant to be a temporary mode of transportation between you, the brewery and your glass. These are not a serving suggestion. So why do we need to pour it in a glass? We, we really need to let the beverage open up and breathe. And most importantly, we need to release that carbonation. Have you ever had someone tell you, oh, I don't like beer because it makes me feel full? Well, there's a reason for that. And uh, let, let's show you um, with a demonstration. Mr. Spencer, uh, bottle or can, sir? Uh, let's roll with the can today. Let's do the can. Okay, let's have right. you pour, pour that into the glass slowly down the side. So we, we want to release as little carbonation as possible. So what we're doing is uh, kind of approximating, if you were drinking from a can, um, what happens to that beer once it gets down in, in, the, in your gut there? All right, that's, that's looking good. Don't spill, your, your mother will yell at us. We don't want that. Can okay, so this is as if you, you drank a beer just straight out of the bottle or can. This paper towel is going to approximate the lining of your stomach, okay? So Cowboy, I want you to stick that, that stick that in there. All right, just all the way down in. Woo! All the way down in. Oh, there you go. All right. Oh my heavens! Oh, what is going on? Oh man, look at that. So, so you've got some foam there. So, if you're drinking it out of a bottle or a can, you're sending it all down with all the carbonation. Yes, you are going to feel full. So, so uh, uh, handy tip of of the day: just pour it into a glass. All right, so I hope, hope you've learned something about trains today, something about craft beer and how to enjoy it today. Uh, if you haven't subscribed yet, please press that little subscribe button and please share with a friend. Like my realtor, Ardea, says, I'm never too busy for your referrals. So as Harold Smith Sr. from Harold's Club once said, I'm with you. Cheers.